Welcome back and thank you for choosing Current Connected. Today we're going to be looking at the Solark 5K1P. This is one of their more budget and DIY friendly models and would be comparable to some of your smaller all-in-one systems such as the LV6548. This inverter is NEMA 3R outdoor rated, so it can be installed in wet environments. It is 23 and a half inches tall, 13 inches wide, and nine and one quarter inches deep coming off the wall. It's rated at 4.8 kilowatts continuous at 120 volts. However, at 240 volts single phase, it can output eight kilowatts. There are six screws that hold on the bottom wiring compartment. If you're familiar with other Solark inverters, you'll notice this one is a little bit different. We do have our familiar grid, load, and generator terminals. However, unlike the other inverters, we only have one circuit breaker for the output, and that is only an overcurrent protection device. It's not like the other inverters that have an actual disconnecting means so you can shut off the input and output power. These AC terminals support up to 50 amps and can fit six gauge wire just fine. However, the gen terminal is limited to 30 amps maximum, and that can be used for either a generator or for AC coupled PV if you wanted to use this inverter as the main controller in an off-grid system. We do have two sets of MPPT inputs. These support two strings each, up to 5.2 kilowatts per string, at up to 500 volts open circuit and 20 amps. Now you can hook up to 26 amps of panels up to these, but they self-limit at 20 amps. These are the typical spring type terminals that the other inverters use, where they flip up and they spring back down and fit up to 10 gauge wire. This inverter does support parallel operations, so we have two RJ45 jacks up here for parallel communication. We have a CAN bus port for battery communications and another Modbus RS485 port for communications with other equipment. And then we have a small terminal block in here for your CT sensors, auto gen start, and temperature sensing inputs. And then last but not least, the two DC terminals, battery plus and battery minus, are down here in the back on the circuit board and they have a 10 millimeter head or a number three Phillips to tighten them. Down on the bottom of the inverter, we have quite a few cable glands. These support all your different cables, including your PV wire entering directly in through the PV ports. There's a blanking plate down here on the bottom that blocks off and watertights the section that the included Wi-Fi and ethernet adapter plugs into. And there is also a vent in case any pressure builds up in this inverter. It is completely sealed from the outside elements. This is the back of the inverter. You can see there are quite a few fins for a heat sink, and I have removed the screws that lock this mounting bracket in place. You would simply mount this to the wall and then hook the inverter on it and put in the two screws that latch it into place. It's a very easy mounting method, and just one person could easily mount this inverter. Now it's time for everybody's favorite section, the teardown. The first thing I'll note is that all of the exterior components are either aluminum or in the case of the fastener, stainless steel. This is really good. It means that this will last the test of time. After removing six of those screws, the bottom compartment with the fans come off and there are three modular connectors that easily disconnect to remove the fans. These connectors are an extremely nice automotive grade connector and they have a blue o-ring in the bottom of the male connector and that's definitely going to keep things watertight and last many years. The cables enter the inverter through a actual gland not just a rubber grommet and this is going to guarantee that there's a good seal. There are screws down either side of the inverter that remove with a Phillips tip screwdriver. They're pretty easy to take out and they have lock washers and flat washers on them, so they're not gonna vibrate out on accident. Two ribbon cables are unplugged, and six electrical wires are unscrewed from the circuit board in the wiring compartment. And then the front part of the inverter simply lifts up and slides over. The first thing I'm greeted by is a bank of 10 315 volt 1000 microfarad Nichicon capacitors. 
Now when it comes to designing a product for reliability, Nichicon is one of the best capacitor manufacturers in the world, so seeing high quality components like this puts us off to a great start. On the topic of the capacitors, the next thing that stands out to me is from a manufacturing standpoint, all of the negative side of every single capacitor, not just in this bank, but also on the other board down below, every single negative is to the left. This means during quality control in production, it's very easy to verify that every single capacitor was placed in the correct polarity. You don't typically see this much effort on a design with stuff designed overseas. So this screams out to me American design because it's very common for stuff manufactured in America to be laid out like this. There was no expense spared on their ribbon cable connectors. Instead of a simple connector that just pushes in, they use the kind that have lever locks, which make this far more likely to pass a real shock and vibration test. And these are all just little things that scream reliability to me. Every single wire in this inverter has a label that correlates to where it goes. And every single wire has a screw terminal attaching it to the circuit board. There are no wires soldered straight to the circuit board, which makes this really nice for assembly and serviceability should anything ever need to be repaired. All of the components that produce a lot of heat are mounted directly to the heat sink on the back of the unit. This is really good because it means the heat is removed directly from the enclosure instead of transmitted to the air within the enclosure and then transmitted out. This will lead to lower operating temperatures and a longer lifetime. And details like this put icing on the cake. This is the main logic board that runs the display and that sort of thing. And it is clearly spaced off of the power board with nylon standoffs and nylon screws. It's clear the engineers wanted to have some separation for electromagnetic interference as well as isolation from the high voltage components. No expense spared on the main 48 volt DC bus bars either. These are nickel plated copper bus bars. After we've scraped some of the nickel plating off, we can very clearly see that these are copper and not brass. Brass is a shortcut some manufacturers take to save costs. You can see their surface mount soldering is absolutely perfect. This chip is about 25 millimeters square and it's very obvious that there are no bridged pads or anything like that. All of the passive components around the chip look absolutely perfect, so absolutely no complaints here. The internal wiring for the AC in and output is 8 gauge 200 degrees Celsius rated. This current wire is going to the load output, so you can see it's plenty big enough for the loads anticipated through that wire. I've noticed every single circuit board has at least a few of these test points. Even the surface mount capacitors follow the same logic where they're all oriented in the same direction. Now that we've seen inside, let's go ahead and get this back together and do a little bit more testing on it. First things first, I'm going to use my 10 millimeter socket to get out the screws here for the battery terminals. And for today's testing, I'm using four gauge cable. However, you ideally would use two gauge cable for 120 volt operation and two aught cable if you were running it up to its full eight kilowatts potential in 240 volts mode. Now I'm getting it going most of the way with the Phillips screwdriver. However, you would definitely want to torque this to the spec defined in the manual. We're moving on to our idle draw test. I currently have a 48 volt SOK rack battery powering the inverter. The inverter is on. I have my Fluke 116 volt meter and my Fluke 287. I'm using this for measuring the current. I can connect the leads going to the Fluke 116 directly on the terminals of the inverter so we can get an accurate voltage measurement. Right now we're getting 53.17 volts. And I'll need to put the leads going to the other meter in line. So I'm going to remove this positive cable. Now everything is on right now and the inverter is pre-charged. This is very important because otherwise I would blow the fuse in my meter with the pre-charging. So I'm going to connect positive to the battery here and then negative I'm going to transfer over to the lead so that this can stay connected the whole time and now the inverter is running through the meter. You can see right now we're getting 52.7 volts at the inverter terminals and we're drawing 1.05 amps DC. That gives us 55.3 watts of idle draw. One thing to make note of, when I touch the screen to turn on the backlight, 
it appears the current only goes up about five to seven milliamps, which is a negligible amount. So this is the true idle consumption of the inverter, and it is slightly less than the 60 watts noted on the spec sheet. Let's check the output waveform. I have my Rigol MSO5074 oscilloscope set up and ready to go. My Tektronix isolator is set up. This is going to take the 120 volt signal as a differential input and feed it into the scope safely so that I don't blow up my scope. Right now I have an AC cord hooked up to the probe so that way I can easily select between the inverter power and grid. And I did wire up an AC cord feeding the input of the inverter, but we're not using that until our next test. I just wanted to get ready. So on this cord here, I have grid power. If I plug into grid power, you can see a nice clean sine wave. However, if I switch over to the inverter, it is still a real sine wave. However, it is a little bit fuzzier. There are a couple of artifacts here, but all in all, this is still a true sine wave. It just has a little bit of noise on it. Not a big deal, depending on what you're powering. Now, if I speed up the scope here, you can see, you can see that there is a pretty significant ripple to it. Nothing, again, that's gonna be the end of the world, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight of these ripples per 500 microseconds. And if we plug that into a period to frequency calculator, we get about 16 kilohertz, and that's likely the operating frequency of the pulse width modulation that gives us our 60 hertz output from this inverter. So at the end of the day, I'm very satisfied with what we found here. A good output waveform, an excellent build quality inside, and of course you can't forget the company backing it. Solark has excellent support and warranty to the point where I actually have them running on my parents' property and my own house. I like them and I like them even more now that I've seen inside. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, leave a thumbs up. Other than that, we'll see you in the next one and hope you have a good day.